Good morning. Welcome to the Lord's Day today. Uh, the series that we are doing is on Revelation and this is Sermon 54 and our chapter is 21 and Tatum Thomas will read from the English Standard Version that's the ESV from verses 6 to 8 And he said to me It is done I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment The one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. We thank the Lord for the reading of the word. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word that was read this morning. We thank you for the power that's behind your word. We thank you for the words that you gave us, that heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will not pass away. Add your power to the word this morning as we would listen to your voice. In Jesus' name, Amen. The language is rich. The way the end is written. It is as if we are already taken to where that horizon is. In God's eyes, it is done. It is done, even before we get there. And let's just taste this idea that we will look more closely at as we go into our sermon. I like the security that this phrase, it is done, spells. We are so few in number as a little flock that we appreciate help when help is expedited. We are most thankful to Jared and Tatum who sets up both the live sermon channel for each Sunday meeting together with the Zoom presentation. They've been so faithful. When I heard a few weeks ago on Sunday, that Jared will be coming from PMB, Peter Maritzburg, early, before the sermon. Then I knew my sermon on that day, my sermon delivery, will be a matter of, it is done. So I present to you the title, It is Done. And my three points are, God's declaration, God's honor, God's directness, God's declaration, God's honor, and God's directness. Let's begin with our first point, God's declaration, verse 6. And he said to me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega. I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. And this sounds like the words of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. It is finished. It is done. And we have to tie the statement there. The cross is like 
the engine that sets the pace and the motion moving the new life of the new birth and also the new heaven and the new earth. And this is God's declaration. The Greek word in the phrase, it is done, has two aspects. One aspect is that it is written in the perfect tense, showing a completed action. The perfect tense shows you a completed action. The second aspect is that it is written in the plural, meaning that everything has happened. Everything. Everything has happened according to God. The finality of our redemption is done. This kind of declaration shows us that the future is not uncertain. The future is not uncertain. When Jesus atoned for us on a cross, he said, It is finished. In other words, it is done. Friends, what do we know about that statement? What can we gather from that statement? He is Alpha and Omega. That's the first alphabet of the Greek and the last alphabet of the Greek, Alpha and Omega. He is beginning and end. And then there's something else he said. He said, I thirst. Imagine the one who said I thirst is the one who owns all the water in the world. And none of us could quench his thirst on the cross. None of us, none of us could quench his thirst. Not even one. But even today, he has streams of water to cleanse and to replenish you. He has living water gushing forth. What would someone do if he owned the only replenishing spring in town? He would charge a fortune. Isn't it a fact that he would charge a fortune? Over the ENCA newscaster, we just heard, or rather, a few months ago, that a company was sued about three million rand for selling a consignment of masks to saps to fulfill an ancient order. That is the way of the world. But God has declared. God has declared that all his counsels will be completed and all his designs will be fulfilled. Everything. Plural. And we drink his water daily. We drink his water daily. And now for my second point. God's honor. God's honor, verses 6 and 7. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. God's honor is his presence with his people. That's God's honor. Have you ever thought of God's honor in that light? Well, take careful note of these two phrases in this text. I will be 
is God. And he will be my son. The intent in the text is that there is no gap. There is no gap whatsoever. And God's presence and fellowship is a picture of flow with his people. Commentator G.K. Beale is right. Why are the saints now referred to individually as sons and not collectively between verses 3 and 7 of Revelation 21? And the key is to look at a verse such as 2 Samuel 7, 14. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. What an affection! When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But you see, he didn't commit any iniquity. We committed iniquity. And he was disciplined with the rod that was supposed to be upon us. He was disciplined with the stripes of the sons of men that was supposed to be upon us. Sons of men meaning sonship. That's a generic term for male and female. And this reference is to a coming son of David at the time it was written in 2 Samuel 7.14. The time of David. Whose kingdom is forever. But our verse 7 in Revelation 21 shows the idea of corporate representation by which Christ represents his people now. Did you know that Christ represents you now? And this makes sense because the saints' status are that they are in Christ. We are in the palm of his hand. And they will inherit fully what he inherits. Everything belongs to him and so everything will belong to you. And this means that at the end, saints will definitely come into their full inheritance. What a glorious day that will be when we die. Angels will come. And there's a, an inheritance for us. Have you noticed that while the saints are known as God's sons, God is not described as father in this verse. And that's the picture of a good Bible study. To observe details, father is not mentioned in this verse, not even described. I can try and supply an answer to this puzzle. And the answer is that Jesus is the eternal Son of God. And all the inheritance is His. But by virtue of Him, we are known as adopted sons. Behold your sonship, male and female. And his inheritance is yours. What a glorious message. God's honor is God's name. And his name is Alpha and Omega. He will see to it. He is the beginning. 
He will accomplish it. He will complete it. He is the Omega. History is like a huge crop. Everything is over against the mighty back cloth of God's eternity. But the psalmist says, From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Psalm 90, verse 2. When you catch the flow of what God is saying, He is saying, It is done. It is done. Oh, oh, what an inheritance. What glory that belongs to God alone. And he shares it with you and with me. As God's name is reliable as Alpha and He will be Omega. He will be Omega. As first, he will be last. As the beginning, he will be the ending. In fact, Jesus will have the last word. He will have the last word. And that is the honor of his name. Isaiah says of God, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. And I will do all that I please, saith the Lord in Isaiah 46.10. What is our part, may I ask that question? We are to conquer. That is to overcome. How thirsty are you to overcome this morning? Our sonship is eternal. We are more than conquerors through Christ, Paul says. In his letter to the Romans. He just ends up in doxology. And doxology is praise. He ends up in joy. That we are more than conquerors. Because we have a sonship that is eternal. And yes, our bodies can be frail and weak. We can be fearful, but our spirits are raised when we know who we are in Christ. We overcome by the grace of God. The merits of Christ. The power of the Holy Spirit. And now for my last point. God's directness. God's directness, verse 8, reads as, But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, and as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Have you noticed God's directness in the midst of sonship? Why? There are those who are borderline cases. If there is one strand of Christian belief which aims at a straight path, it is the reformed faith. But there is such a thing as a deformed faith. It is one thing to thirst and be an overcomer, but another thing to thirst 
and be a defector. And the latter are mere professors of the faith. They only offer lip service to God. Are you one of those that offer lip service to God? Are you walking in the personal encounter of the Lord Jesus? Who are these that offer lip service to God? Scripture calls them in this verse the cowardly and the faithless. And Jesus describes them as betrayers because the minute the pressure level goes up, they back out. They can't endure. They can't continue. They back out. Treason is committed. Matthew thirteen twenty one. How should we describe these people? They are what I call sippers. They only sip from the cup of the gospel. And they are still sipping. And throughout their lives, they just go on. They continue to sip. They don't drink deeply into the cup of salvation. They have a false sense of thirst. They are thirsty still, and they don't care. Why are they mentioned in the same breath as the believers? It is because their influence is infectious. And their lifestyle is what believers should not do. John is not saying that believers have never committed such sins and will not commit them. John is asking them to renounce any such influence that is trailing them. John is appealing to what has happened to them. They have been washed in the blood of Jesus. You see how God is so direct? God is direct and we should thank him for that. Our past sins have been done away with. There is a great future ahead. And the sad thing in life is that many choose to follow after where their rebellious life is leading them. It leads to the lake. It leads to the lake of fire. It leads to the lake that burns with fire, that burns with sulfur, which is the second death. And the reality is that in the new heaven and new earth, there is place for this unending death. And on the one hand, it displays the love of God for those who won't go there. But on the other hand, it displays the justice of God for those who have chosen to make their bed in hell. They don't even, they don't have even a streak of loyalty towards Christ. They are cowards with no roots. They easily crum compromise the gospel. They easily compromise the gospel. Are you one of those that take all these treasures of Christ? and compromise the gospel? What hypocrisy? I end with an illustration. During our Christian life, two voices brazenly call our attention. 
One is the voice of the Lamb telling us to listen to the Master's voice. But there is another voice, the voice of a wild dog. It's that old nature we've done away with that comes with that voice. It screams from inside of us to portray its attributes. It wants us to rebel. But the Good Shepherd, the Lord Jesus, is reminding us that his work is done. It is done. Let's live in view of that today. And now let us receive the benediction. And now may the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us today and world without end. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to this sermon. If you wish to hear more from Trevor Thomas, please like and share this video. Make sure to subscribe to the channel Apostolic Witness and to turn on the notification bell. May the Lord bless and keep you.